Welcome to Copy Chief Radio. Today's show is a new breed episode where today's most innovative marketing and copywriting stars share their most effective methods for optimizing results in the fast changing world of direct response marketing. To check out all the Copy Chief Radio episode types, go to copychief.com forward slash CCR. What's up, everybody? It's Kev. And today, let's get philosophical. I was just telling Jamie, who's my guest today, that I may be a Stoic and I don't know it. If you've read or thought anything about Stoicism, you may be firmly planted in that philosophy and that way of living. You may have uh, just heard other people writing about it. I know there's been some popular books about it in our industry in the recent years. Jamie's doing a really cool thing. You know, he's bringing it into his copywriting and teaches in this fantastic lead magnet that everybody needs to go download at stoicathenium.com. There'll be links in the show notes, but it's a Stoic's Guide to Content Marketing, and it helps you understand the philosophy and how you can begin to infuse that into your copy principles, your content, really make it stand out. It's really nice, Jamie, when we can live our philosophy, not just in our personal lives, but in our work. So thanks for being here, man. I'm excited to dig into this with you. Well, thanks for the introduction, Kevin. That was great. I mean, to get into the weeds of what philosophy means in multiple contexts and how it can be applied personally and in copywriting and beyond that is really fun for me to dive into. And stoicism at its core is literally just about trying to control what you can control. And for me, it's quite interesting because when I first thought about it, there was the debate of little S stoicism versus big S stoicism. And I'll hold my hands up. I was quite guilty of diving into the character trait of keeping a stiff upper lip, as we British people like to say. It's just Mm -hmm. not talking about things. Whereas when I discovered the biggest stoicism, the philosophy, it really reframed my mentality in such a profound way in the sense that it's showing up to be active in the world in in a way that makes sense to you. It's learning how to regulate your emotions appropriately, trying to live by certain principles and trying to uplift your communities in a way that makes sense to you as well. Bring that into the concrete, like how does that show up in your day-to-day life? For instance, what are some things, behaviors, thoughts, philosophies you would have had before that are different now? Well, I'll say it from the pandemic because this is where my interest in philosophy really got going because I was not trained classically in it and never studied it. It was only through trying to reframe certain things in, in a chaotic situation, and that was the draw for me. It started with listening to podcasts, reading books, and trying to understand it from my own perspective. And personally, I did feel quite anxious in the sense that I thought I didn't have control, but that was my thoughts just moving all over the place place but once it started from that simple place of only choosing what I could control i.e what was around me in that moment I had the power to listen to podcasts and whatnot and what really grabbed me about the philosophy is that it's built on four key principles of justice wisdom self-control and courage and once I tried to apply it through that lens it started to make sense personally what I like about the philosophy is that it's very practical and simple to understand and the actual practices that you can do with it have been game changing for me. A particular exercise that I like to implement is called the premeditation of adversity. And that is attributed mm. to a guy called Seneca, who was, in my opinion, one of the first real psychologists in the world before psychology was even a thing. And essentially what Seneca wrote about was trying to prepare for the worst case scenario. On the surface, when I first started looking into that, I thought, It seems quite negative, but once you dive into it, it's trying to prepare for the worst case scenario. So if you look at it in a copywriting context, for example, you might sit on a call on a sales call and think, right, the outcome is uncertain because hopefully I might get business from it, but I've got to find a way to build that resilience in yourself if if it doesn't go to plan, but it still could go well. The point is, it's Mm -hmm. that scenario to say, right, what would it be like in that scenario? How could I prepare I could do a bunch of research. I could try to dive into what that customer has already told me if it's got that far or so on. And then by doing that repeatedly, it 
mutes the anxiety or that self-doubt or imposter syndrome that might come up there. And in different situations, I found that to be very helpful from a personal and a business standpoint as well. Yeah, that's interesting that a lot of freelancers, you know, they go into it in their resigned to take what comes along. And like you said, kind of hope for the best. It's like, I'll show up, I'll do my part, but I can't control whether they hire me or not. And so when you start to think ahead to what could happen, so essentially you're more prepared for all the objections or tactical things on the call. Is it that, or is it the philosophy of I'm going to be prepared, I'm going to be ready, but I'm also fine accepting the outcome? Yeah, it's a bit of both. It's interesting because you can still prepare yourself to the best of your ability, but even Mm -hmm. if you try to get somebody over the line, then it's great. But I think you still have to have some kind of safety net mentally to say that still it could not go my way and then you just accept it and then that's fine because you could still, after that, hypothetically say that, oh, it went well, but then you might think, oh, what could have done different? And then you might start to beat yourself up on that because you're trying to regulate your self-talk. And in that scenario, I find that helpful. Stoicism really provides that safety net in an uncertain world, I think. Yeah, I like that. I think people think of, um, right, they say, you know, the person's stoic, right, as a, as, a, as a verb. And they think that means they're kind of stiff, they're kind of hard, hard to read, hard to converse with. You never know really what they're thinking. Where does that lie when people are practicing stoicism? Have you found that to be common? Or is that just sort of an assumption? I think it's an assumption and it goes back to the idea of a said versus little less stoicism versus big S stoicism because Mm -hmm. I'd really loved ancient history since I was a kid anyway. And the books that really drew me into that was the meditations written by Marcus Aurelius, the Roman emperor. And I remember diving into it, knowing nothing about stoicism anyway, because I thought, okay, it was recommended to me. And yeah, I can see certain like elements that, apply to me but I didn't really look beyond it and then years later when I understood what the philosophy was I've read the book again and then it opened so many different doors to me because if you take Marcus Aurelius as an example he dedicated his life to that and he was a leader he was one of the last good emperors of Rome and the guy had to deal with all kinds of stuff coming at him he was He was dealing with a plague at the time in his own life, similar to how the pandemic was. And to him, he had to be a leader, but he was also a very emotional man as well, behind closed doors, in public as well. And when you think of stoicism, you might think of somebody who's robotic or unfeeling and indifferent. But in that personal example, you can show up to have a laugh. You can see the funny sides of things and still call yourself a stoic or have stoic tendencies if you choose to identify as such what i love about philosophy personally is it's not just stuck in place modern stoicism has evolved to a place where it is more nuanced and you can bring in different perspectives but going back to the basics of where it came from is always instructive to see how it has evolved as well look i get it i know there's so many communities I'm doing air quotes, communities for entrepreneurs out there, all filled with their own version of overnight experts chirping at you from behind the screen. You got your Facebook groups, your your clubhouse rooms, just experts galore. Uh, How often do you feel like you're being pinballed around from thing to thing and pick it up a little bit, a little piece there? How much of that is actually making it into your, your brain and your fingers and your business and affecting your money? How many of these people are actually out there in the field getting their hands dirty and testing to find out what actually works and what flops? Well, in the copy chief community, a real community, you get shoulder to shoulder with the most active, successful marketers working in the trenches today, all while learning from industry legends who rarely teach anywhere else, if ever. Copy chief is an amazing community, super newbie friendly. Also, you'll find, you know, elite level uh, marketers and copywriters in there. They're all working to become the best at their craft, get paid top dollar for their skills, stay ahead of the competition by keeping their finger on the pulse of what's working now. That's the X factor when you're backed up by a community and you can get any question you have answered by people who actually do this stuff and can tell you from real world experience what to do 
for your project, for your offer, for your funnel, for your clients. Man, you're unstoppable when you've got that kind of confidence. Go check us out at copychief.com forward slash join. If you've never been a member, you're going to see what you've been missing and you're going to say, where has this been all my life? And if you've been a, a member in the past, I would invite you to come and check out all the new stuff. We've completely updated all the tech. So we're on brand new platforms. Everything is slick and smooth and easy to access. And it's just, it's never been better. Copychief.com forward slash join. I'll look for you inside. So when did you start to see it in your work or decide that you wanted to make it a, a copywriting philosophy as well? It was just as the pandemic was winding down because I thought I'd been copywriting for almost eight years up to that point. And mm. honestly, I felt quite burnt out for a number of reasons. And because I applied this to my mental health personally, it made me look at the copywriting industry in a brand new way as well. And I realized that every business has some sort of philosophy or set of values that they believe in or they want to communicate with their audience. And to me, copy and content is key to that because right. it's how you communicate your message, but going deeper into your values as well, you've got to understand how you practice what you preach and all the work that goes into that with a strategy or some kind of positioning with your branding, all of that ties into it. And then you can also practice what you preach personally, if you're bringing it into your business with your staff and how you recruit and your customers and so on. Yeah, for sure. You, you go into this in depth in the, the guide, how to write like a, a Roman emperor is a great section. The tone can be all kinds of different things, right? It can be serious, professional, thoughtful, funny, conversational. And it's just never been more important than now to nail the voice of your, of your brand, of yourself, of your guru, whatever it is. Yeah, as we all know, there's so much information, so much free information, so much good free information. You've got to stand out in different ways. It can't just be good content. Oh, absolutely. And I would always recommend, in my personal opinion, before any brand decides to create any kind of content or copy, they need some sort of consistency. And that's where a tone of voice guide will come in handy to take that top down level to say, how do you want your products to sound? Is there some internal jargon that only you would understand, but how do you want to portray that to your customers? And to me, that forms part of their wider journey of a brand philosophy journey, as I like to coin within this particular aspect of what I think about. You talk about writing short, punchy sentences. Marcus Reyes wrote many short sentences to remind himself of key points. Talk about that a bit. Yeah, well, I find it fascinating how these ancient philosophers who were probably rock stars in their day crafted their own particular tone of voice and if you take marcus for example in the meditations a lot of what he writes is in like quite staccato rhythms where he's just because he never intended that book for publication he only wrote to himself to remember to be a better person and as you would expect in a journal you just do a lot of you know, repetitions and repeating that and when diving into his tone of voice that just came up a lot to me and the tone and the emotions that he evokes are timeless in the sense that you can see another human being genuinely struggling with his version of what he wants to show up as in the world. But if you look at somebody like Seneca as well, he was doing it for an entirely different reason. Seneca was a guy who wanted to live stoicism to a certain point, but he also had an agenda to craft his own tone of voice in a very stylistic way with his book called Letters from a Stoic, where essentially he crafted many letters to his friend Lucilius, reflecting on his own life and timeless lessons that are still applicable today. But if you look at it from a branding perspective, Seneca was a master of that because he brought a lot of rhetoric into his written work to go with like long flowing cadences where he's telling a story. But the images that he's evoking are very vivid as well, if you think about it from that tone perspective. So Seneca personally was a, a kick-ass marketer for, for his own stuff, but still his, yeah. his work is still timeless and it's still very applicable and practical if you want to dive into that as well. Yeah. Yeah, I love this. It's so interesting because we think of these people that they've lived in such a different time and, and 
everything was so extreme. It's hard to imagine that they were, had these dynamic personalities almost, right? It's like, you're just trying to stay alive or conquer a nation or, you know, these things keep you busy as I understand. <laughs> and to see, you know, the, I love it again in the report. So you break it down, like how Seneca thought and wrote, how Marcus thought and wrote. And in Seneca's, you know, it's like number two is crack jokes. You say that he was a self-deprecating writer, unafraid of poking fun at himself to elicit a response in the reader. That's really an advanced comedic strategy. Oh, indeed. Yeah. And um, I'm going to butcher this uh, reference, but essentially in one of his letters, I remember he was writing a funny anecdote about being at sea. So this is where this idea of cracking jokes, which I saw in this analysis, where he basically says to put himself on the level of the reader that, I might talk about all of this philosophical stuff, but I'm still human. I still get sick at sea. And I think it's like a really like little self-deprecating look at himself to say that I can emphasize with other people, but I also want the reader to see themselves in what I'm writing about at the same time. So good. Yeah, you mentioned the modern Ryan Holiday, obviously is had a lot of success writing and talking about this. Let's get into one tactical thing, if, if we can. You mentioned the uh, brand circles of care that use to analyze the values of a business and then develop copy or content that reflects those values. Could you school us on that a little bit? Yeah. So again, it came from an interest in philosophy because that feeds into what I do. But where that came from was this idea called the circles of concern by a guy called Hierocles, who essentially invented these concentric circles which start with the self and the mind and the other circles will be perhaps your family or your friends or the rest of the world and the idea is you're trying to bring these circles closer to your sense of self and to try to show up appropriately with the people in that particular circle and then I thought that this is so applicable to brands as well, especially from a values perspective, because surely you want to bring your customers, your employees, your partners and your industry as close to yourself as possible. So there are a few ways that I do it. And the idea that it starts with is I think when values, if you think about it, we all think of buzzwords where you might think, oh i want to be ethical or I'm authentic but mm -hmm. alone there is no context they just seem quite hollow to me and i think yeah. brand can run the risk of just coasting on those words without doing some analysis so if i apply it to my own personal journey when crafting this framework i thought how am i going to show up and live my values i wanted to build it around the four stoic virtues justice courage temperance and wisdom so it's asking myself personal questions to say how have I tried to apply those personally and in business? And then I do the same thing for a particular set of buzzwords for that client through my own analysis. Then it will spin out into how these particular words attract to their customers, whether it's their customer journey, how do they show up like that with their online content? If it's necessary about the employees and the partners, then it's holding them accountable to say, how would you handle mental health with an employee or how would your values resonate with choosing a partner? And then finally, with the industry, it's looking at your competitors. How do they show up with their values? What industry topics are they talking about that's getting their name out there? And then that can serve as the basis to create content ideas. So there are many ways you you can use it but essentially that is the workshop that where it starts with a foundational element of values but equally i get to know that business better anyway and then i can create the content out of that if necessary and do you find when you're researching a, a company you're working with that a lot of that you can find just looking through their stuff or have they not thought through a lot of that and you have to really interrogate them about it bring them to that place yeah, it's really interesting because I think people generally at the end of the day have some kind of knowledge of what they stand for, but they might just not have that much clarity. So I will always just start with basic exercises of saying, you surely have these buzzwords, but let's interrogate them to see how you do them personally and in business. And if necessary, if depending on the size of the company, then it can be a sense of bringing in people from senior management or employees as well, because it's not just seeing it from a CEO's perspective, if it was with that company, it's right. seeing it from all levels. But equally, if it's just a solopreneur, then it's easy to do that one-to-one -one because it's only just them trying to show up to, to serve their customers. So it, it just varies depending on the organization, I think. That's a huge 
value right there just to have them think of that and and put it on display. I know it was only two years ago because we were installing the EOS operating system in our business where I had to really go in and define our core values. Man, it was it was a great exercise. And what it did for the team was incredible to see them on display and realize that, yeah, that is why I'm here. That is what I want more of. So that alone is an incredible service to provide a company. And so what kind of companies do you work with typically? Is it bigger organizations where you're creating content plans for them or, or is it DR companies? So it's varied. The, the way that I offer the workshop, it's set into tiers really. So you can have like a startup package where it's people just basically who don't really have an understanding of the values. So it's a bit of a light work with what I like to call a values analysis. So that could apply to any solopreneur but then you've got the midway where people want to see how those values are infused across all of their businesses and then it might just be a case of working with solopreneurs again or organizations that might have about one to ten staff but equally i'm in the process of developing a much more in-depth workshop where it will be split across wider organizations and seeing it from that top down as well so that's the thing it goes back to the fluid uh, nature of values and philosophy as well this workshop mm-hmm. is always evolving but from doing it again and again i'm always going to get better at seeing how it can be improved and right. how I can improve my personal philosophy as well as my values are evolving and forged through this yeah that's the amazing thing about this business to me right is like everything's a work in progress everything's evolving and when you can land on on the, your thing like you have that it's so deeply entrenched in who you are it really doesn't feel like work. It's it's a journey of discovery. The value you can provide is only going to get greater as you learn more. Exactly. And that's, there's a, another favorite philosopher of mine called Epictetus, who's another Stoic. And basically a quote that came from him was, never be afraid to show up and act like you don't know something. Because to me, again, my personal belief is there, it never ends. You're always going to learn. And I'm happy to hold my hands up and say I don't have all the answers at the end of the day, even with this workshop. It's always developing, but I know I can help people in a way that makes sense to them with trying to position their values. Super cool. And how do you run the workshops? Is it like a, a group workshop where you go six weeks over Zoom calls or how's that work? So it can just be one-to-one at the moment, but as it expands out, I know I'll do it with groups and essentially with, depending on the organizations, then it may come down to interviewing other staff members as well, if in a group or one-to-one, depending on the nature. But again, it is looking at the different perspectives because I guarantee a CEO probably will have slightly different values to somebody who came in on an, and is still quite new to the business and it needs to be aligned to somewhere in the middle where it makes sense across everybody's wavelength. Yeah. Well, awesome, man. This sounds like in some ways it's only just beginning for you, but it's so it's already so defined. It's exciting. So a Stoics Guide to Content Marketing is, is the download you want to get from Jamie at stoicanthonyum.com. If you can't spell it, just look it up. You'll find it. <laughs> and we'll have links in the show notes. Jamie, this was a great conversation. I really enjoyed it, man. I'll be, I'll be watching your stuff and I hope we, hope we can do it again. Awesome. Well, again, thanks so much for the invite, Kev. I've really enjoyed making you see that. I think you are a bit of a stoic and you do know it now. So yeah, <laughs> that was a great conversation and I look forward to continuing to talk in the future. Thanks, buddy. Likewise. Talk soon. Hey, don't forget your goodies. Head over to copychief.com slash copy chief radio to get some great free stuff to help you put the things you hear on the show into action for your business copychief.com forward slash ccr